Thanks, Adam. Uh, yeah, so really looking forward to today's session. So on this panel, we have uh, Pierre Lorenzo Dorca, who's uh, CEO of Italigas. We have Ewan Norris, who's head of Smart Cities at Scottish Power. Unfortunately, Jamie Stapleton isn't able to make it. So we have Thierry Polle from um, Hitachi ABB. And then finally, uh, but not least, we have Tim Manhadra. Sorry, Tim, I think I put your surname wrong there. Um, I should have asked you that earlier uh, from UKPN. And um, we've got a really exciting uh, agenda. So welcome everyone. Morning. Checking, we're all online. Morning. Yeah. Yeah. Um, hello, okay. everybody. Great. So the first question uh, I wanted to pose to the panel was to really bring consumers into, into this debate and say, assuming that we all buy into the prosumer movement, and by that we mean that consumers at a domestic level or even at a large business level want to take more control over their energy needs and the supply sources of their energy and, and the demand management in, in their home or business what role do we see uh, networks play in that and how does digital technology help us with that that was the first question i wanted to pose to the, to the panel uh ewan would you like to start thank you uh, good morning everyone so when well, you're, you're entirely right uh, consumers are the key to this and and consumers are now taking greater control of their future energy needs. Um, a lot of the advancement that we've seen in recent years in terms of digitalization has been about how we manage power flows, particularly from the network side of things, but there's an increasing shift in terms of the, uh, the requirements of the, the consumers to actually be able to harness the opportunity to take more, greater control of their own energy needs. And that means there'll be more behind the meter technologies come to the fore. Now, digitalization is affecting all industries as we know, but in energy, it's going to be a key component. Um, and, and we have to make good use of that digitalization to enable that transition and evolution uh, to a low carbon economy at the pace that's necessary to meet the future uh, net zero targets. Yeah, totally. And Pierre, you were saying earlier that over in Italy, you, you've got, how many smart meters did you say it was? We, as of today, we have run about uh, 7,500,000. Increasing and day by day, because we are replacing. Indeed, the yeah. Yeah, and yeah. the digitization of the, the gas grid is enabling a more active consumer in Italy. Uh, well, um, not yet at a household level, uh, while uh, on, at, at an industrial level and the commercial consumer level, definitely yes. Um, as you know, uh, Italy is, uh, I mean, is, is not rich of uh, uh, primary energy sources, so natural gas is, is, is a, a source of, of cost for, a, for any industry. And, uh, and so there is a lot of attention about uh, uh, daily consumption, hourly consumptions, and so on. So the massive program, the massive plan that we are uh, executing uh, by replacing the old traditional meters with new smart meters is helping and supporting uh, this kind of customers to uh, reduce their consumptions. Uh, the next uh, step is to, uh, to involve also the household users. You know, there is not uh, uh, such a, a level of uh, maturity like in the electricity sector where uh, households are experiencing, have been experiencing smart meter uh, for uh, over a decade in Italy today. So gas smart metering is fairly new for uh, domestic consumption. Yeah, makes sense. And, and, and Tim, over at UKPN, what, what do you find? Because obviously you've got a, a large area as well with a, a number of, sort of big cities and regional side what, what does it look like for you in terms of that prosumer engagement within the uh, and the challenges that poses to the network yeah and you can kind of as the distribution network operator um, in the southeast of england so uh, we have uh, i guess the two level of digitalization we're starting from the our network physical assets in our network in our substations and um uh, what we have seen over the last two decades, uh, this, uh, the, uh, the gradual uh, digitalization of our substation devices, to, which has increasingly more 
um, um, IP enabled or internet, internet protocol enabled uh, devices. They are smart devices, IEDs, they are connected to our network and they're providing um, a huge amount of data to our control center or our data centers. Um, and they they, uh, they are going from our EHV or extra high voltage for uh, to to the medium voltage to the low voltage network as as we are rolling out um, a digital equipment or sensors and devices in our low voltage network. So the the, the journey is still continuing, uh, but it's the voltage level is going down. And 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 also the second part of it, as you mentioned. Um, William is the uh, interface to the in, uh, to the rest of the world, uh, as in, in our customers, our suppliers, our uh, uh, flexibility providers, for example, all, all, and also um, interface to uh, transmission networks, uh, national grid. Uh, in our case, uh, the, the ESO. So there, there has been a lot of uh, work over the last, uh, you know, the, the two decades, or at least in the last five years or so, that it has really picked up in, in uh, the getting the data from our network uh, and also interfacing to uh, the prosumers the the, the 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 providers that that the, that we in, in the past didn't use to so only from 2016 15 onwards we started uh, interfacing with generators and and now uh, we are interfacing with demand customers uh, we never used to have a data connection now we are increasingly having uh, data connections to the rest of the uh, market players in our industry. So, and Thierry, finally, over to you on this one. Well, of course, we have been talking about um, uh, residential users participating in uh, grid uh, services, but uh, an another class of uh, prosumers is, of course, the um, industrial customers, the real estate customers, the transport customers, retail customers. Think of mining, data centers, uh, e-mobility um, uh, prosumers that uh, for which digital infrastructure is required to be able to participate in the market, be it for uh, ancillary service, primary, secondary, tertiary reserve, it could be for power quality services, it could be for uh, inertia provisioning in, in the grid, or, or it could be for, for other type of services. So. Um, where in the past it was really the, the uh, very large uh, generation or load customers that uh, were traditionally participating to those markets. Now, smaller uh, capacity customers directly or through aggregation could be participating to these uh, markets. And, and for that, the necessary digital infrastructure needs to be rolled out. And where are we with standards for that in terms of whether that be between say the interface from a data perspective between the ESO and, and a, a local network, or whether that be across different geographies, how are sort of standards for that interaction between different sources of demand and different generation and then different parties within the network uh, progressing? I'll take that one on. Uh, William, I think one of the things that is important is that you know we have to get that interoperability between different systems. We, we talk on a regular basis about a whole system approach and part of that is making it easier for uh, many actors within the industry to, to, to come in and, and link into the various uh, areas of the network that uh, is required. You now there will be a hierarchy, there will be a requirement you know you know from a a network point of view to ensure that some of those systems are ring fenced quite rightly from a system security and reliability point of view but as we move you know further into as we were talking about that prosumer world there needs to be common protocols open protocols to enable that transition to happen at the pace necessary yeah i totally agree with that and i suppose so this brings on to the second question around i guess data security the volume of data aggregation and also those open protocols. Um, so the question I really wanted to ask was how comfortable are network operators um, with moving data to the cloud? Um, does that does the source of data matter? Does the type of data matter? Does the use case of the data matter in terms of where the cloud will play a role? Is there certain cloud providers that appeal to us more uh, or less? Um, and I suppose that, that debate around edge versus cloud and also then afterwards i wanted to touch upon machine learning 
versus say artificial intelligence and where that's going to play a role and the value that can bring to the networks but if we could start first with a question around comfort you know of migrating to the cloud and what that what challenges that does pose that would be fantastic please uh tim yeah i mean we are already using cloud for various um various uh, applications so not the case of uh, cloud or not i think cloud is definitely the way to go uh, for mainly for uh, management of critical applications, as in our control systems, where we have um, um, uh, systems currently uh, on on premise, the traditional systems as you can call it, and the reason for that, to keeping it there, is for the security of supply to make make sure we have uh, control and we have uh, 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 our own system that we can manage physically, um, and it, it's not reliant on uh, you know. Uh, Sort of cloud system or you know some the devices the, the hardware that's not in your premises that you cannot manage yourself in in this in, in situations uh, where we may need you know, we may, um, um, respond very quickly to the network events so uh, and that and also the second part of that is also having deterministic as we call the deterministic nature of the uh, systems where we are not we are we need uh, when we when we basically control our network as in you know opening and closing circuit breakers in substations we need a uh, deterministic level of uh, um, service and that is something that is not really i think we are not comfortable at the moment to run control uh, signals over uh, over cloud so only apart from those but every uh, most of our other systems are already on cloud or are in the process of migrating into cloud. So there, there are two two levels here where we we are happy with things that not on based on you know critical uh, network management type which are in on premise, but the uh, the other systems are in cloud. And the reason and there is a lot of benefit with the cloud because it is easy to deploy easy to manage and easy and is very scalable it's you know and it does provide a lot of uh, benefits for us so uh, wherever possible we would uh, we would uh, opt for that and, yeah that makes sense and you and i think you made a similar uh, distinction is is that fair yeah very much so i think the uh, you know Ultimately, when you look at a grid infrastructure, you want that to be safe, secure. As Tim just mentioned, some of the more critical aspects of the operation will always, uh, you know, you know, be at the gift of the network operator to make sure that that's as secure as possible. But you know, the world of cloud has evolved in the recent years as well, and 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 so has the the security around that. But it's 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 using it for the right applications. As, as Tim mentioned, it you know from a very you know quick deployment and enable you to scale. Um, the cloud is essential, and and you know that is part of the interoperability that we, we we probably desire to make things transition a little bit quicker. So yeah, and the right application, the cloud has its place, and again, the cloud will evolve uh, in terms of providing the security and necessary reliability. You know that network operators require and users of the energy. And Pierre, did you say that you've fully embraced the cloud within? Italagas. Yes, mm, that's true. Um, we we had to make a, a, some sort of forced choice because the company used to rely on the um, hardware on premises of our main shareholder, SNAM, which is a national TSO, gas TSO, and we had to separate from SNAM. So uh, instead of building a brand new uh, infrastructure on premises, we decided to migrate completely on cloud at the end of 2017. It was a, an, a huge project for us. We've been, we worked on that project for over a year to accomplish the migration, but uh, we have been on cloud now for uh, four years, four full years. We, we are pretty satisfied. We had only benefits from that choice. Uh, just to mention a, a couple of real benefits that we gained. Uh, for example, uh, as, I, as I mentioned before, we are executing a massive replacement of uh, traditional meters. This means that day by day we increase the fleet of smart meters uh, installed, uh, sending data in real time to our systems. And the scale up uh, was uh, easily accomplished uh, uh, relying on uh, on the cloud. Uh, we uh, 
currently manage big data because we have more than 7 million meters installed sending data every minute to, the, to our systems. And the other, the other recent example, the other re recent benefit we gained was during uh, COVID pandemic. Uh, as you may uh, know, uh, in Italy, uh, a, a sudden lockdown, total lockdown was decided over a weekend, overnight. Really. So we left our offices on, the fr on Friday and we, we had to shut down our buildings over the weekend. And we, uh, we had a seamless experience. We have more than uh, uh, 3,000 employees. Um, all of them are equipped with mobile devices, either smartphones or tablets or PC or uh, all of them. And we did not have any trouble, any issue at all from the very first minute of our uh, smart working mode. So we, we, we had this uh, uh, cloud infrastructure which fully supported us in, uh, uh, in running the business uh, remotely. And this is very, very important when you have to run uh, uh, business, business of networks, as we say. Uh, we have more than 2,000 people on the territory all over Italy. Uh, and so, you know, relying on the, on the cloud, you know, with their tablets and so on, also from a workforce uh, management standpoint is very valuable. So we are pretty satisfied yeah. of this uh, decision. That's fantastic. It's, it's a really good testament to sort of your confidence in the security and using operational processes, not just say for data modeling um, and, and data analytics in the cloud. That's a really great use case, isn't it? Demonstrating that it can can get to where it needs to be for people. And um, Thierry, in terms of Hitachi ABB, um, What's your current view on, on the cloud suitability for networks um, and the products that networks need? And, and also then around that distinction between what goes in an edge and what a device and what's going um, into the cloud in terms of decision making, logic, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Yes, so the, the benefits of, of the cloud is that it provides a, a scalable, possibly cost efficient, virtualized IT infrastructure on top of which one can deploy a set of enterprise applications. Um, for example, planning, management, field service, digital workforce, customer experience, asset performance management, and, and possibly operations, which is of course one of the big debates if that is uh, possible. Ultimately, one would uh, want to build a, a full digital twin of the network and electrical infrastructure, like the electrical stations, which one would like to model even at the uh, grid component level. And at the same time, the cloud could serve as a data repo, which is capturing lots of grid events, asset and grid status information, which then would provide a holistic perspective that can lead to better operations and asset lifecycle management. Two dimensions that historically have been split, but in going forward, really need to be jointly looked at. There are, however, a number of real challenges to, to cloud-based uh, operations uh, or cloud usage in, in general. And these relate to cloud adoption. For example, the trust in the model. Um, other panel uh, mm -hmm. members have said, okay, there is, uh, there is a, an issue related to security or data sovereignty. The second challenge is data ingestion cost-efficient data ingestion into the cloud. And then the third is the balance between edge and cloud intelligence, where to make the split, what to do locally, what to do in the, in the cloud. It's an, yeah, and it's an interesting one because I, you know, just speaking candidly, I, I've been involved with two cloud platforms and you could argue they're not as mission critical as network operation systems, but um, in terms of say Kalusa and Kraken, the two systems I've worked on firsthand, they're both scale billing systems with payment collection, GDPR compliance, workforce management, uh, trade settlement and capture, those sort of elements within that. And, you know, Kalusa and Kraken both now have uh, flexibility, so kind of VPP capabilities, and they are 100% cloud-based um, and have been through numerous audits in terms of security, performance, scalability, etc. And so it's just uh, something I always find fascinating because for me, the cloud 
I've never considered building software not in the cloud, whereas I, I like to hear the, the counter opinion. So it is a, a really interesting debate. And I suppose that brings me on to the second point I wanted to discuss, which was around the kind of machine learning or artificial intelligence and whether the, the distinction between those names really matters. I, I don't think so for this use, for this debate. But where do we see those things fitting into this digitization of networks? And what benefits are they actually going to bring? Because there's an awful lot of hype around these kind of concepts, isn't there? You know, like, great, you've got artificial intelligence working out, you know, field service management related tasks or something. And turns out the net gain is, you know, 0.1% efficiency or something. And that's probably not really as exciting as it. But, you know, we're all looking for what are the real benefits that are going to be driven? And I'd love to hear from, from each of you around where you're seeing those things and, and the role of, you know, digital uh, platforms and enabling those things because they are much harder to do on premise, for example, aren't they? Happy to jump in again. So again, AI, you know, it's got a critical role, you know, and 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 again in the right applications. So for me, you know, the, with the growth in renewables, that you know, the intermittency of the the kind of you know nature of the generation that we're going to see certainly going forward, and how that marries up with uh, flexibility, services demand. Now, AI is going to be play a critical role in essentially understanding how you get greater utilisation over out the existing network. You know, and that that's one of the key things that the network operators certainly have been working on in, in, in the last few years is you know using technology to get more out of the existing network. And when we say more, the physical assets are the physical assets. You will still need to invest in that network in terms of power transfer uh, and to ensure that you know people can. To live, live and, and move forward with their lives, but there are times when you can actually, you know, particularly in the planning stage, AI can support a lot of that development, uh, a lot of that understanding of how the, the network's likely to operate in the future. And I think, you know, deterministic when when you need to do something, as Tim said, i.e., open a breaker, take a control action, we have a safety. You need that, you know, you know, kind of analog, you know, uh, view. It. You need you, you do something, something happens, but. When it comes to the day-to-day -day operation of the network and powerful, I think we need to move away from that deterministic approach, where it's very much you know something happens and that has a, a, a direct effect. The world is changing significantly, and how people are used power, how people actually um, want to interact with their network, how people actually want to interact with their peers in terms of energy, is going to change. So these these systems and and, te and you know artificial intelligence is going to play an increasingly important role. Otherwise, we will get stagnated and we won't develop at the pace we need. Yeah, like in terms of... Go, go to you, uh, What is, is, is an important tool for data-centric statistics-based analysis of the grids in a journey to autonomy. And one might think that in the energy system today, we have really collected a very broad set of statistical data. On, on, for example, failure modes that lead to um, interruptions in, in the grid or in the network. But this is not uh, necessarily true. So one of the, the key essential points will be to collect that data to be able to accurately uh, assess the risk uh, to which the electrical system will be exposed. So from that perspective, machine learning will be a tool once we have the statistical data on the grid. Yeah. yeah, just to add on to that, I think there's a huge potential for AI or machine learning in, in the in any industry really, but also definitely for electricity industry. As we are moving more towards proactive uh, uh, sort of management or active management, I think that's where AI comes in. Um, even at the moment or even in the near future, I don't see using AI for deterministic application. As you mentioned, it's, you know, there's, I guess, a divide where we want things to happen uh, you know, here and now you would obviously use uh, in a deterministic solutions rather than probabilistic solutions. So uh, where, where we need forecasting, so forecasting is a key key aspects where we are already using AI, machine learning for, you know, to, to, to something that we can, and there has to be some degree of confidence uh, dependent, and that those will, I'm sure will grow, but the level of confidence on AI based uh, applications or AI based outputs uh, is, is going to grow as, as, as the models become more mature as, as we, as we have experienced in them, but that's going to take time for at least the network companies to be able to adopt them. But 
you know, there, there are lots of, sort of predictive analytics, as you mentioned, for to, to, uh, for maintenance of our network or, or you know, forecasting of where uh, generation and demand for, uh, you know, finding the right volume to dispatch um, uh, flexibility, for example, those are very key areas. Um, and also for, um, also for a longer term planning as well for in investments so to, to plan investments as well that there is uh, you know for you know longer term more than you know more than weeks and months so if there are uh, there are various uh, uh, algorithms that can run and that can loop in various regulatory and uh, industry data as well to to do long term forecasting as well so there's various applications for that Yeah, and Pierre, did you did you have anything on this one? Yes, we started uh, uh, working concretely on uh, uh, machine learning, um, especially for predictive maintenance of our networks. We uh, presently run more than seventy thousand kilometers of, uh, of of pipes all over Italy, and uh, we 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 are leveraging on the big data that we collect from the field, both from uh, smart meters and also from uh, the use of a cutting edge technology for gas leak detection, which is called Picarro. We have uh, in place a joint venture with this uh, um, uh, American company. Um, and uh, what, what we are doing is uh, developing uh, some uh, innovative algorithms in order to predict faults uh, on smart meters, for example. Uh, so we are now in position of replacing smart meters before they actually uh, have a, a, an issue, a technical issue. And, uh, and also for reducing the uh, fugitive emissions from our uh, pipelines, uh, we collect data from the fields and uh, uh, we are using this data to make forecast about the uh, likelihood of uh, having new gas leaks uh, uh, in a certain portion of the grid. So we replace the pipes well before uh, the, they have uh, uh, completed their lifetime. And uh, so we are uh, working on this, uh, on this field in order to address the main pains of uh, uh, gas distribution. Uh, these are two examples, the, 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 the readings, the accuracy of readings on one side and the fugitive emissions on the other side. But we are launching new projects for developing new algorithms also for other uh, aspects like, for example, gas consumption for gas preheating, which reduces emissions and, uh, uh, and, and so makes the company more sustainable. Uh, we are starting a, a project right in these days for uh, developing algorithms for uh, the odorizer injection, which is a toxic component. So we, we, we want to, I mean, to reduce the uh, consumption of the, of the odorizer to the minimum extent possible. So uh, it, it's really, a, I mean, it, it, it's like a construction side in progress. We have a lot of, uh, of project teams uh, all together. Um, we have established a physical space fully dedicated to this type of projects, which is called Digital Factory in our headquarter in Milano. And we are hosting now a dozen project teams uh, which, which uh, sit in this building and they, uh, on a full-time basis, they are working to develop algorithms uh, uh, for uh, predictive maintenance uh, using machine learning. I think just to yes, jump in, right. one of the things we just jump into the uh, the AI and use of AI, and I don't. I think we should probably just take a point to reflect and actually say that's all predicated on good quality data, uh, being able to feed into you know any machine that can learn from it. And I think one of the things that we must recognise that we're we're just coming into that world of digitalisation, and particularly in a, in the context of a network. You know, a majority of those systems and, and that network is already in place and has been for several years. And it'll take a, a period of time uh, for, for, for that data to be coming at the right level of granularity to be able to maximise its use in, in, in terms of AI, particularly, you know, some, some areas, you know, will be quicker than others. But I don't think we should lose sight of that fact that the data that is relied upon to make that machine learning and, and to make best use of that has probably still to emerge. Uh, it's coming, it's, it's been coming in for several years, but it's probably not at the levels that we 
eat you into the leap of being able to use it with any great certainty in the And would you echo that, Tim? Would you would you say, sort of, from UKPN's perspective, that it, it, the maturity of the data available for machine learning against it is, you know, work in progress still, in your experience? Yeah, absolutely. I think data quality is key, uh, not just for machine learning, but for if our day-to-day -day work. I mean, we struggle with it's just the volume of data because of it is not hundreds of thousands we have in the tens of thousands uh, of uh, devices or, or hundreds of thousands of devices but tens of thousands of sites uh, and, and networks so it, it, it's a very big task in in terms of managing data uh, and and they 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 keep growing and the devices keep growing the data data sets are keep growing and it's going to be an ongoing challenge for us of, of, of getting up we're not we're never going to get to 100 uh, percent data quality but to to an acceptable level of data quality that we can use and we can rely on is going to be our uh, continuous challenge i think um particularly to to have confidence on the ai based applications you, you, we need to have uh, you know a, a very strict valid validation and, 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 and a process in place for data quality management and it's yeah. a challenge. Um, well, one question I had was around sort of is it fair to say then the distinction between where we see good data quality but not accessible for things like machine learning etc so in the say the SCADA system world which is typically done at, at location on premise has good quality data but it's hard to sort of ship up upstream so to speak you know in, into a, digi a full digital platform versus other bits of data that may have you know be easy to pipe around but are not necessarily as accurate is that a fair distinction or is that a massive oversimplification from from me there uh, I wouldn't say so. I don't think that's a challenge. Once we have the data, I, I think shipping the data or or processing data is is less of a challenge. Uh, either we put it in the cloud, and this is you know small infrastructural architectural uh, challenges that that can be easily you know, done as a routine job. It's it's more about uh, having having the confidence in your data and also having uh, you know processes in place to be able to maintain your data because. The sensors, those, those are in the network, they do degrade over time, all of them, and there's a need to uh, calibrate them, need to uh, test them, need to manage them. So it's, it's an ongoing process and it's something that you know, keeps, just keeps growing rather than you, know, you, will never, <laughs> you, you will never be able to overtake it. Yeah. Hope that answers your question. Else? Yeah. It does, yeah. Anyone else on, on this one or we, we could move on to the next question? Yeah. Well, well I, I could uh, step in there. So obviously machine learning is, is, is uh, important in the context of asset performance management. Uh, in order to have the data ingestion, various customers are building out uh, assets to capture a bit of critical parameters that are during the state of the assets which then has to be fed into the uh, statistical models that then, uh, where then a machine learning is applied. There are, of course, other use cases, uh, other than life cycle management or, or cases related to prognostics of uh, asset health. This could be related to, for example, um, uh, non-intrusive monitoring of the field force to understand whether uh, they are in the, the safety guardrails, whether they are, for example, wearing their safety gear, um, and that, that could be another use case. It, uh, another uh, use case could be like uh, processing uh, satellite imagery to understand the uh, installed base of, of plants in the grid. Um, another use case could be related to video analytics or acoustic analytics for non-intrusive um, uh, measurements and the analysis related to failure of assets. So that there is a whole a broad set of, of cases where one can apply advanced machine learning techniques, uh, such as uh, Bayesian networks or Markov change, from which one then can infer uh, conclusions and then um, to which a learning stage is added based on the data collected. <clears throat> yeah, makes sense. We. We've been working on a project recently within my own business. Um, we've been trying to work out, so 
for one, I'll just give you a two second on it. So when you produce hydrogen through electrolysis, the hydrogen, the, the electrolyzer's performance changes over time due to degradation of the anode and the cathode, etc. And so we've been building algorithms that start to understand based on different power into the electrolyzer, how quickly you're affecting the asset's life. And it has to be predictive because it turns out there's not many electrolyzers that have been around for 15 years. <laughs> so, so you have to work out how quickly the the curve of, of degradation will change based on different power profiles that you feed that electrolyzer. Uh, you know, so does ramping up and down more aggressively or running at 80 percent to 20 percent versus say 100 to zero? Is there differences and what does that do? And obviously, so it's a completely predictive exercise and it's. Uh, but it's one that we, we find very interesting. So uh, it's kind of halfway between being able to fully go into AI because you can't give the, the models all of the, the learning experience yet, but you can give it lots of stuff and let them start to learn and then tell it how it's performing over time and let them get better. So it's been an interesting experience going through that one. So the day's question I wanted to pose to the group and conscious that we've got a blend of power and, and gas related stakeholders on this one was around how do we get to 100% uh renewable electricity on networks and i know that sounds like a an easy question but what i really want to get into is the detail of the challenges that poses so assuming that you know at a high level we're all buying into the story i say all most people are buying into the need to get to 100 percent renewable electricity that's going to be a completely different grid to what it looks like today in terms of having a lot less control over the generation sources. What does that look like? You know, how are we going to get there? What challenges does that pose to us, whether they be commercial, technical, digital? You know, what, what does that look like? Okay, you, jump in. Since you always go first, you might as well. You always go first. That's a good one. I like it. It's easier. Uh, you can give your opinions and listen. Uh, the reality is that... <laughs> You know, I think we've got to look at this two, two stages. So, you know, the grid is, you know, electrification is key to meeting our future targets and, and, and where appropriate other technologies will, will form part of the mix. But as I said that right at the start of the session, you know, the consumer, uh, both the private consumer, industrial, commercial consumer, they're changing. So they're changing in terms of their, their drive for sustainability. How do they do that? Will they take greater control of their own energy production and use on site? So you're going to see, you know, significant growth in renewables in, in the coming years to meet those energy challenges and sustainability goals. And, and we always think about renewables of, of, of getting it away, putting it on the network. Well, actually, what will be happening is the displacement of existing demand. So if you've got generation that isn't uh, part of a, a demand group, that, you know, how the network operates you know, and, and functions and ensures that there's a still that route to market is going to be key. But that intermittency in itself provides an opportunity. So that technologies that we need to deploy those assets will need to interact with a, a variety of actors. And that could be, as I said earlier, peer-to-peer -peer trading, that could be local DNO, you know, flexibility services, and it could feed into the national grid. And I think we've got to uh, be, you know, understand the needs to harness those opportunities. And that's only going to come forward with, you know, clear, transparent, open protocols, how people can actually aggregate and actually provide services to the market that mitigates the overall need uh, for the, for that, you know, delays in infrastructure that, that could exist if it all comes at once. So, you know, we, we can get to a high penetration of renewables, but how we do things uh, needs to change. And it's probably the technologies, a number of technologies is already there, technologies emerging, but also we need to look at the cultural piece about how we embrace it. Uh, and, and that's, from, from an energy industry point of view um, and, and actually look to other industries where they are, are probably already harnessing technology to make better use of the existing assets. So, you know, we have a, a great opportunity, but we also need to be sure it's done in, a, in a, a safe and secure way. We can't get around that, but the reality is we can't, we can't not stop using technology and advancing technology, digitalization, because if we did that, we, we, we wouldn't get to the, where we need to be in terms of renewable energies and, 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 and complementary technologies will have a place in the future energy system. So, so as indicated, some type of renewables depict a very dynamic seasonal capacity behavior. 
And one of the questions is really how to design a techno-economical viable grid infrastructure to integrate those type of renewables. So to which extent uh, does one allow the network and the electrical assets to be stressed versus investing into a full redundant infrastructure? And that's where, where a, a proper risk management framework needs to come in. Investors on one hand target a certain return from their renewable projects. So they have to optimize the investment level in infrastructure versus the, the risk of outage during the runtime. And that requires an, an alignment between design, operational practice, life cycle management practice, spare parts management, uh, and so forth. And then the question is how to spread that risk uh, across the various stakeholders, the asset owner, the asset operator, the service partner and potential financial infrastructures that uh, to which uh, infra institutions to which risk can be financial risk can be transferred to. So the main risks are business interruption, asset failure and replacement and safety risks. And, and Thierry, where have you seen, so which, which countries are like set up at a network level to enable that best, you know, whether that be the regulatory framework or the investment time horizon, et cetera, because obviously, you know, I, I have relatively oh, brief knowledge of the UK DNO setup, but in terms of what that would look mm -hmm. like in, in other geographies, I, I, I wouldn't know. Is there, is there any countries where the networks are given the opportunity to design you know, what's needed uh, and the costs are spread fairly and, and, and that includes maintenance, etc. Very good question. So it looks at uh, the regulatory landscape. Historically, uh, regulators were requesting the DNOs to provide uh, a health status of their critical assets. So an, an inventory of all the, uh, the key assets and the associated health and that then linked to towards the investment plans for uh, uh, life cycle projects or replacements, so network planning basically. The, the um, uh, regulators are maturing these kind of frameworks and are advancing them um, to incorporate more advanced risk management methodologies. U the UK is, is one of the leading um, uh, re uh, regions uh, where the regulator is, is supporting this kind and developing this kind of uh, risk frameworks. That's good to know. <laughs> um, and Pierre, so I guess, you know, what, how does a gas network view this question as, in terms of 100% renewable electricity networks? Well, yes, I, see, I think that this is the million dollar question. I mean, uh, uh, first of all, uh, I, I, I maybe, don't maybe two more zeros for, for, for some. Yeah, <laughs> two more zeros, yes. <laughs> One billion, maybe. Uh, first of all, I think it's uh, unrealistic to have uh, a common uh, answer, a gen general answer to this question because the real perspectives of development of renewable energies are very country specific. And so I'm talking for, uh, for Italy, uh, which is at a good level of development, thanks to the, to the, the last decade where um, we experienced uh, massive increase in wind power and photovoltaics. Uh, we have a problem related to the availability of, 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 of spaces of land uh, and costs, of course. So we, we do not like to have offshore wind because we have very variable cost. And uh, I mean, Italian and I think also foreign tourists coming to Italy, they wouldn't like to, to see windmills uh, in front of their uh, beaches. We have scarcity of uh, land because we are a country of nearly 60 million of uh, uh, inhabitants in a, a relatively small uh, piece of land. If you consider that we have a lot of mountains and so on, so there is scarcity of lands. And uh, so we have a plan for installing 40 gigawatt additional power of uh, renewables in the next uh, uh, 10 years, but we are dramatically uh, late compared to this uh, target and uh, even if we reached this target and then i can't see how we can since the increase of power year over year is a few hundred megawatt and not gigawatt even if we we we, we reach this target uh, 
this would not correspond to 100% of renewable energy. So all in all, we have to uh, consider, at least in Italy, that uh, natural gas will be uh, an important uh, source of energy uh, for the next uh, 20 years at least. So having said this, uh, uh, we believe, I believe that uh, uh, we do not, uh, we, we, we do not, we, we mustn't run the risk of demonizing investment of natural gas grids, uh, because otherwise we will, uh, uh, we will uh, run the, the concrete risk of uh, being short of, of energy. So we have to enhance investment also on natural grids. What we are doing, for example, uh, as a company, Ital Gas, we are investing massively in digitization of the grids, in upgrading, in order to get the existing network prepared and adequate to receive the renewable gases of the future, like hydrogen, like biomethane, like synthetic gas, and so on. So uh, we believe that gas infrastructure is a valuable asset for Italy, I think for all Europe, and uh, we we cannot uh, afford to, uh, to 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 divest from this uh, uh, from this infrastructure. What we can do is to let the infrastructure evolve and uh, uh, be ready for, uh, uh, for 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 supporting the transition to the uh, decarbonized economy by uh, dispatching new gases. That's what we are doing. Yeah, makes sense. And and Tim, so in the south of east of the UK for UKPM, you know, is it possible to get to one hundred percent renewable electricity um, at a network level? And and what challenges is that going to pose? And and I suppose again, leading slightly towards the agenda, what what digital what digital what options are there from a digital perspective that will help with that? Is probably the key question. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, Pierre sort of uh, <laughs> said already. It's, it's a big question. Hundred percent renewables. Is it realistic? You know, is it? I'm sure it's something we all need to strive for. There's a lot of challenges. Not 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 just the technical challenges. There's a lot, lots of other other types of uh, challenges in here too. I think net zero. We all all have a realistic, uh, hopefully realistic target to get there. Uh, but for renewable generation to actually support the network, um, I think that that's going to be a, and lots of things need to change. I mean, the, 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 our networks, our electrical network infrastructure is designed, not wasn't I wasn't designed to in, run on renewable uh, in a generation to start with. And uh, we already have challenges with the uh, uh, energy flowing and and different directions, uh, which you didn't have before. And so digitalization here is already supporting, uh, you know, uh, the um, use of Active Network Manager, for example, that we've been rolling out, all all DNOs probably have been rolling out over the last 10 years or so, um, to manage uh, some of the uh, challenges, as in, you know, managing constraints actively and, and, and managing the outputs of new generation being, being variable that you can't always rely on because of the variable nature of it. So you need to balance them in the sense. Uh, so the digital technologies that, you know, we, we as, as I get to perhaps the previous point on the whole systems approach is, I guess that's where it, we can't just look at distribution, transformation or generation. You know, we really need to take a whole system approach if we were to, where to get near to 100% renewables, and you know, that, that's a really, really big ambitious uh, target, I think. But I'm sure we can get near to it. But you know, again, uh, for that, we need to have a uh, you know very highly optimized uh, grid as a whole grid, whole system, Mr. Highly, highly integrated and highly coordinated. So you know, we're already doing some work with National Grid ESO at the moment over the last few years in in whole system optimization and coordination. Uh, and dispatching um, uh, services to national grid, also managing constraints or connecting uh, customers in our network against the constraints on national grid on the transmission level so, uh, as part of the connected manager. So there are various initiatives already happening, but I think the road is uh, quite long. The journey is quite uh, difficult to get to 100% renewables. Uh, uh, yeah, but that's definitely an ambitious target. I think we should all should uh, uh, start towards. And, and I yeah, that, thanks, Tim. I suppose about 
leading on slightly linked to that so i like to think about you know like if we had we accelerate on 20 years and we have got a high penetration of renewables and uh, on the electricity grids would it be acceptable at that point to have ev charge points and i don't mean necessarily domestic single charge points but more say your fast charge on the motorway where you've got multi-megawatts of demand would it be acceptable to have those being curtailed at times when then say the network's got challenges rather than at a national level there's generation shortfall which we might be able to make up for other sources you know whether that be renewable gas to power or etc but at a network level would that be acceptable because my view is in a dynamic grid you know this is part of the decisions we need to make are we designing the grid to to never have to have curtailed ev charging or are we are we willing to live with the two days a year when fast chargers need to run at 50 percent capacity and what does that look like is a question I mean, um, of that question, I think the answer is it's a commercial um, it, it, because all uh, we have an obligation to provide service to the, uh, all connectees to our network. If, if it's a firm connection, if, if the connection, either demand or generation has a you know, firmer access to our network, then we really, unless it's a very, uh, you know, dire situation, emergency situation, we do have, have uh, our grid code does allow us to in curtail uh, uh, our customers or the outputs of our customers, so outputs. but for, for where we are going now, we are going more on the flexible uh, side of things where uh, this is flexible demand or flexible generation. So, and they have, uh, you know, separate contracts or the commercial arrangements with us. And based on the commercial arrangements, we should, the digital system then should be in place to make sure that we optimize the network so that, that we always maximize either the demand or generation so that they, our customers don't get an unnecessarily curtailed. I would say, I think, I, I hope that answers your question. It's not, I guess, uh, about being acceptable or not acceptable. I think it's, we have no, to- No, I, I think it's, it's exactly what like you're saying. Uh, I think that, that's potentially the- Honoring the contracts, really. Maybe the transition that will occur is that there'll be many more dynamic connections offered and taken up due to commercials and, and far less firm to enable those outcomes and a, and a more dynamic grid. You, you, what do you think on this one? I think just going back to A&M, uh, as Tim spoke about, I know many DNOs have actually put in place and Thierry touched on it before and uh, you know, just when you're dealing with uh, wind or renewable generators and your commercial offering was a, a period of curtailment, that, that, that was quite a difficult conversation to undertake with uh, obviously investors uh, uh, who are who are looking to you know get a return on that investment and in, in uh, those renewable assets, and those are commercially astute individuals who have a, a good degree of knowledge of the market. Albeit this was an emerging market, if you put that into a consumer space, you know look at the the current issues we've seen with the fuel shortages or drivers, you know the panic. Can you imagine you know taking that to the, the next generation and saying actually we're moving to EVs. And, and there might be periods of time where, the, where you won't have uh, that capability to power your vehicle and move on with your life. I think that would be a difficult sell. So I think we've got to come up with different ways to, to ensure that, as Tim says, you know, the power continues to flow. I think we've got to make use of technology so we're harnessing renewables. a and has been very good at getting renewables on uh, in the short term, but ultimately it's about turning them off when there's no capacity. What we need to be doing is harnessing that power into other energy vectors mean hydrogen production or battery storage so that we can have that continuation and that visibility is key. We're now going to have a network which is connecting hundreds of thousands of assets. Uh, so digitalization of those na network assets, visibility, being able to dispatch is going to be critical. Um, so we, we, we should be moving in that direction rather than seeing, you know, actually there might be points of curtailment. Yeah, we, we all know that, you know, the network has uh, got physical constraints at times, but you know, to, to move forward, which, you know, we electrification uh, is key to our renewable, renewables connecting and obviously our, our future targets. We've got to be ambitious in meeting those and we've got to, you know, put in place the systems, commercial mechanisms and, 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 and the, the re resilience that, you know, allows people to go through their daily lives and just know that they, they can still rely on that electrification. But I recognise what Tim says in terms of the, you know, the, the, the supply and constraints yeah just touching on what you touched on there because i think it's an interesting point which is 
these forms of dispatchable load and, and things like power to gas or, or uh, static batteries as a grid balancing tool, etc. So I suppose specifically one that I think unites the panel a little is um, power to hydrogen. So that's something that you know I personally see a, an opportunity in uh, you know in terms of being able to take curtailed wind or, or, or grid connection solar where it's not being utilised as, as fully as it could be and, and using that for um, hydro production, you know, so there's, there's a lot of sceptics around green hydro production and its inefficiency and its use case. But ultimately, I think if we are to see a large penetration of renewables on the electricity side, power to gas will be part of that mix. The ratio of that probably unclear. Um, Pierre, do, do you see that role, you know, that power to gas piece is something that unites the sort of power networks and the gas networks and, and you know, is that a, an interesting theme to, to, to touch upon here? Yes, definitely, yes. I, I strongly believe in the opportunity uh, to build power to gas plants, uh, not only power to hydrogen, but also with the upgrade of hydrogen into, uh, into synthetic uh, methane. Uh, and I totally agree with you on position. Uh, so we, we, we have to, I mean, the, 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 right, the right way to address this uh, big challenge that everyone has to face towards a uh, transition to, towards a decarbonized economy is to think of both systems, gas and electricity, and how, to, how they can uh, cooperate for the common target. And so what, what is called the sector capping. And power to gas is, uh, uh, in my opinion, the only concrete example of sector capping that we, uh, we can develop in the next uh, decade. Uh, we are developing a, a, an innovative project uh, in Italy uh, where we will experience uh, uh, the sector coupling on fields. Uh, we will produce uh, uh, green hydrogen starting from uh, photovoltaic power and uh, we will use this hydrogen uh, for various final uh, destinations uses, uh, both industrial but also for households. We will blend this hydrogen with natural gas and dispatch the mixture to uh, to some hundreds of families in Sardinia Island. This will uh, will be the first, uh, um, I, I would say, residential community uh, fed with a mixture of uh, green gas and natural gas, uh, for sure in Italy, one of the first uh, in Europe and where there is a, an important project in, ongoing in, at Leeds in UK, which is ahead of us. But uh, I mean, we're, we're talking of a few projects really in, uh, in, in worldwide level, and um, and I think that this is a, a, a real example of how we can leverage on the uh, existing gas networks in order to support the electricity uh, network uh, when there are a surplus of production of, uh, for example, of uh, uh, renewable energy. Frankly speaking. As of today, uh, the production of uh, uh, green hydrogen uh, uh, suffers, uh, still suffers from uh, uh, several barriers, which makes the uh, production itself uh, uh, barely sustainable from an economic standpoint. The main two barriers are the uh, cost of uh, renewable e electricity, which is still uh, rather high uh, compared to the uh, cost of production of the of the hydrogen and uh, uh, the cost of the electrolyzers, which are, I mean, uh, off the shelf equipment, but it's an it's a, it's a nice a nice equipment. So we have to uh, foster the production of this equipment in order to uh, deliver economy of scale and reduce dramatically the total cost of ownership of such plants. These are the challenges that uh, uh, we have to address if we, if we really want to develop this uh, new stream of. Uh, uh, of projects, but every sense, Thanks, having yeah. said this, I strongly believe that there is a, this is a viable option that we have to uh, develop uh, in order to leverage the uh, the existing assets that are spread all over, all over Europe. 
Yeah, well, so we've got about 15 seconds left, so I'll probably just do a, a brief wrap up. So I think that's been a really interesting debate and hopefully we've touched upon how digitalization is affecting networks and, and whether they be gas or power, there's a, a particularly interesting overlap there across the digital uh, digital problems. So thanks everyone for your time on that. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Welcome.